tonight, which means, as Chris said, we have two chapters left in this over year long journey through the gospel of Mark we've been in together. And we've been calling it the new Exodus. Now, 10 points, 10 heavenly points for anyone who can remember why we're calling this the new Exodus. Love it. Yes, you are all right. And I know that just nobody wanted to interrupt one another. (laughs) We've been calling it the new Exodus because as Mark shares this story of Jesus, tells this good news of Jesus, he's tracing it back. He's looking back to the story of God freeing the Israelites from slavery in Egypt, out of slavery, into promised relationship, into worship, into their promised land. And he's saying, you see this, this Jesus, this liberating movement of Jesus is also an exodus out of the slavery of sin and into the kingdom of God, all right? So that's why we've been calling this the new exodus of, of Jesus in Mark. So go ahead, open your Bibles to Mark 15. I'm going to try to adjust my stand here. This is our recipe book stand that we totally use for everything except recipes, I guess. This is a heavenly recipe you could say. Okay, yeah, I'm done. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha! Okay, this is totally working. Um, as you get to chapter 15, you will notice that tonight we are in the crucifixion of Jesus. So happy Valentine's Day, everybody. Uh, this really is the most remarkable divine love moment. And I am very humbled to teach this tonight because the crucifixion is the central moment of the Christian faith. It's the central moment of the Christian faith. And so we need to do our very best as Christians to grasp what happened on the cross. Because as Paul says in 1 Corinthians, we preach Christ crucified. That's what we Christians preach Christ crucified. So yes, it is the climax of the good news of Jesus. It absolutely is. But it is also the climax of the history of the world and humanity thus far, right? And so my hope tonight, this is a little bit different of approach than sometimes I'll take, is to really teach some heavy theology. I hope you guys are just ready. We're going to teach some theology. I want to trace this moment of the cross back through the narrative of the Old Testament. But also, I don't want to get so academic that we don't find ourselves wrapped up in this story. That Jesus was a real man, the real Savior of the world, who actually died a Roman's crucifixion for you and I in the sake of the world for the forgiveness of sins, all right? He became not only our personal king and our personal savior in that moment, he did, but he became the king and the savior of the world. Come on. So we are preaching Christ crucified tonight, all right? Are you guys with me? It's been a bit of a quiet night. I don't know what the social distancing is doing here, but we're here. We are family. We're together. Okay, so where are we picking up the text tonight? Uh, Let's just trace a bit of where we've been in the last couple weeks of Mark, all right? Um, Early on in the series, we mentioned that Mark is written to a Roman audience. Uh, And so so essentially, he's writing to Rome, who is kind of um, the empirical rule of Rome, (laughs) in essence, embodies the evil and sin of the world, of Egypt, of Babylon, et cetera, et cetera. And in this last week of Jesus's life, um, he, he came into Rome, or into Jerusalem, sorry, in a very kingly, uh, very honorable way. But things quickly get dark as we progress through the chapters of Mark. I also just want to say, any noises that happen, helicopters, air compressors, it's just a thing out here, okay? Um, but things quickly get dark as he flips the merchant tables and just really honestly pisses off some leading officials. He gets in these heated, big arguments of debates and theology uh, with some Pharisees and other leading officials. And all those crowds that at one point we saw following him around that are like, oh my gosh, he's amazing. He does all things well. Oh my God. Like, they are not there anymore. Things are getting dark quick in the Gospel of Mark. And we're catching on to that. They're getting dark quick. Like, they're secretly scheming to arrest and kill him. And his own disciple of Judas, at his hands, he is the one who will scheme to betray him to the leading officials. And it's right in the middle of this, right in the middle of all of this chaos, that Jesus sits down for a Passover meal with his friends, his disciples. 
And the Passover meal was a meal that had been celebrated for hundreds and hundreds of years. This meal, and, and all of them would have been familiar with it, shared in it plenty of times, was full of symbolism that pointed back to the moment that their faithful God freed their ancestors from slavery in Egypt. And so they eat things like these bitter herbs. And the bitter herbs, they literally bring tears to your eyes. They're so bitter. And it's to remind them of the bitterness that their ancestors had to endure in slavery in Egypt. They, they eat the haraset, which is this mixture of apples and nuts and honey. And it's to emulate the mortar of the bricks that they used uh, or that they made in slavery in Egypt. And then they would eat unleavened bread, uh, bread without yeast. And that was to, to remember how quickly their ancestors had to flee from slavery in Egypt. They didn't even have time to let bread rise overnight. They had to go, right? And then they would eat lamb and they would drink wine. And this was to represent the blood of the innocent lamb who, that anybody who marked their doorpost with the blood of the lamb was marked as a child of God and it brought their redemption from Egypt. And so Jesus and his friends, they begin this journey back into their history, eating the bitter greens and, and eating the haraset and the karpas, remembering the faithfulness of their God. And then Jesus does something <laughs> very unorthodox, something that had never been done before. He gives them the standard bread, and he says, here, take this bread. It's, it's my body broken for you. And then he gives them the wine and says, drink this. This is my blood of the new co covenant poured out for many. And, and we should be reading this, and the disciples most definitely were like, wait, no, Jesus, no, 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 no. We eat the bread to remember how quickly our ancestors had to flee from slavery in Egypt. And we drink the wine to remember the innocent lamb that marked our, sla or our freedom from slavery in Egypt. This meal is pointing to the, fast, the past, not the future. But Jesus is up to something very, very different here that I want you to catch on to. Because Jesus is no longer pointing to the past or focusing on the past at least. He's pointing to the past to make a point about the future. That there's a new exodus on its way. And that in just a few hours, Jesus will usher in this new exodus. A liberation from, a justice against, and a destruction of evil and sin and oppression and slavery. But it's no longer the blood of the lamb that will become their means for freedom, but it is the blood of of Jesus that will become the means of rescue and deliverance for the whole world. How beautiful is that? How beautiful is that? And so that tonight is where we open the text in Mark 15. If you've turned your Bible there, we're going to be in, uh, we're going to start in verse 16. I'm going to jump around a little bit. So Brandon's going to do his best to follow me, but I'll, I'll give it to you, all right? This is the crucifixion of our King Jesus that we're about to read together, family. Verse 16, the soldiers led Jesus into the palace, that, that is the praetorium, and called together the whole company of soldiers. They put a purple robe on him, then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him. And they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews. And again and again they struck him on his head with a staff and they spit on him. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him, and when they had mocked him, they, put, they took off the purple robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. And now verse 25. It was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, King of the Jews. They crucified him, two rebels with him, one on his right and one on his left. And those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, So... You who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this Messiah, this King of Israel, very sarcastic here, come down now from the cross so that we may see and believe. And those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. Verse 37, with a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. 
And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood at his feet watched how Jesus died, he said, surely this man was the son of God. So how does this crucifixion, this ultimate moment of shame and horror and punishment, how does this become the central defining moment of the Christian faith? Because it is absolutely an ultimate failure in the eyes of the world. And I don't think I need to say that um, crucifixion was not some like honorable thing in the ancient world. It wasn't like, wow, you've been such an upright, outstanding citizen. Let's torture you and hang you on a Christ, right? This was the ultimate form of capital punishment. Even the Romans saw it as the most shameful way for somebody to die. So then how does it? How does this become the defining moment, the forgiveness of sins and the salvation of the world? Now, I'll be honest with you. I'm a young 26-year-old trying to get my mind all wrapped around this and my heart all wrapped up in this. I don't think I have all the perfect articulations for you. I don't even believe that in the cross there is one specific theological theory for us to believe that perfectly describes everything that happened on the cross and sums it up into one nice and neat and tidy theory for us to believe. But what I do know is that on the cross, when Jesus bore the tragedy and the punishment of the sin of the world in his own body, a revolution began that would defeat the powerful regime of evil and oppression and sin and death eternally. And this revolution, it embarked the new exodus, where much like the Egyptian exodus, God was amongst his people, ready to liberate them from the power of evil and sin and into worship and into right relationship with him and into their promised inheritance. That's what Jesus was up to on the cross. All right, you guys with me? Come on. Now, there was another problem here though, okay? See, the other problem is that God had created all of humanity, all the world, every individual with the job or vocation, if you will, to reflect his love and care and goodness into the world. But sin began to infect the world. So, so God took this family, the Israelites, and he set them apart to be a light to, a, to the world. In essence, to be the very solution to the problem of evil in the world. And this was meant to be their worship back to God, right? But just like everybody else, just like everybody else, they became addicted to that same evil. And instead of reflecting the image of God back into the world, they reflected sin and evil into the world. So see right here, it wasn't just an empire or the sin of an empire that was holding his people captive. It was their own sin that was holding them captive. Well, what do you mean, Tyler? What do you mean their old sin was holding them captive? I want to use an illustration uh, by N.T. Wright. I love this illustration that I think will help us understand the essence of sin and punishment in the Bible. There is a bit of everything, but I think this is kind of what's getting, what I'm getting at when I say their own sin held them captive. So when he talks about sin and punishment, he talks about this. We probably shouldn't think about it like we're heading 90 miles an hour down a back road and we just so happen to pass a cop on that road and he sees us and stops us and we get caught for that sin. And so he pulls us over and we reap the punishment of having to pay a fine, right? That's probably not the best way to think of it. It's a very moralistic idea between God and us. Um, and I'm not saying it's wrong per se. I just don't know if it's the essence. I think what the Israelites were seeing more happen with them is better like this. You're going 90 miles an hour down a back road. You're a dangerous driver. You're swer swerving in and out of cars and you come up over a hill and right when you come over that hill, you didn't know that there's a stop sign right there with six other cars sitting at it. And you don't have time to stop. You're out of control. And so not only are you going to hurt everybody, or you're not only going to hurt yourself by the wreckage, you're going to hurt everybody else in your path too. And so here, these Israelites, 
they've put themselves in that same predicament. They're, they're um, going 90 miles an hour down a back road. And their history becomes the consequence of that irresponsibility. So much so that their own sin gets them back into slavery, back into exile again, but this time with the Babylonians, right? And then uh, later on, it, actually where we are in this moment, that the Israelites are doing a better job, and probably the whole world for that matter, of reflecting and embodying the oppressive rule of the kingdom of Rome rather than the kingdom of God. And so the fate of this nation and really the world is becoming dangerous, not only for themselves, but everybody else around them. That is how they ended up in exile once again. So when Jesus sits down with his friends for this Passover meal, these are the kind of stories they have in mind. These are the stories that they connect to an exodus. And now Jesus is pointing to a new exodus. And this is where you and I find ourselves all wrapped up in this story. That just like the Israelites, the evil in the world isn't just out there. It's not just their problem. But it's also made its home right here in you and me. That we too have become a part of the problem of evil on this world. And that's not a popular message, is it? That's not a popular message. I might not be woke enough for you, <laughs> but that's not necessarily the most popular message. Whatever happened to live and let live? Come on, you do you. I do me. They do them. It's all good. It's all good. But the problem is, is that that's just not the Christian message. If Jesus' message is your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven then the earth needs to look a lot more like, a king, like the kingdom of heaven and a lot less like the evil we often inject into it. You know what I'm saying? And please catch me here that I'm not just talking about some disembodied heavenly realm that you qualify to go to once you hop off the earth. I'm talking about Revelation 5. That God purchased us with his blood to restore us back to reign on earth. Not just some disembodied heaven. Heaven and earth becoming one reality. That is the biblical narrative of heaven and earth. And the thing is, is we want God to get rid of the evil in the world, right? We want that. That's popular. We all love that. But like Tim Mackey says on the Bible Project, we just don't want him to get rid of us. <laughs> and I just let me just diffuse some things right here. God does not want to get rid of you, okay? If you are like me as a 10-year-old, you can just take a big breath God's not just waiting up, ready to crush, right? He is a good God. He's a good God. That's a misinterpretation of the cross, but we'll get to it. We will get to it. But if the purpose of a new exodus that Jesus is pointing to is to restore us back to our original vocation of worship to God, to be a light to the world, and to live in right relationship with him, then sin has to be dealt with, right? Right? And that's that somehow there needs to be a revolution against the power of sin that continues to infect this world with its consequences that needs to be defeated for good. And you know what's amazing? Truly good news is that Jesus himself and the evangelists who wrote about him, and the apostle Paul himself believed that that is exactly what happened on a Roman cross 2,000 years ago when Jesus laid down his life. They believe that is exactly what happened. First Peter 2, he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Colossians 2, then God made you alive with Christ, for he forgave all our sins. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authority. He shamed them publicly on the cross with his victory over them. That deserves some praise, y'all. Then Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 says, The Messiah died for our sins according to the scriptures. According to the scriptures. Now that's an important piece for us to catch, okay? He's not talking about his letters that he was writing to churches. Those would not have been canonized. He's not even talking about the gospels. Those wouldn't have been written yet. He's talking about the, the Hebrew scriptures or what we know as the Old Testament, right? 
What he's saying essentially is that somewhere in there, in that narrative holds our understanding of what it means for the, mes- for the Messiah to die for our sins. And so we go soaking ourselves in the narrative of the Old Testament. And we find all these moments and these clues in, in the Old Testament, like in Isaiah 53, that there will be somebody, a deliverer, who will suffer on behalf of others to end all suffering. Or we look in Exodus and Leviticus, where God makes a covenant with his people. We just read this as a church uh, through Exodus and Leviticus. And this covenant is all about grace and holiness and right relationship with him and each other. And so we offer him these sacrifices. And, and these sacrifices from the beginning are meant to be a pleasing aroma, a special gift to the Lord. They're not a way of appeasing an angry God, okay? That is a pagan way of sacrificing, not the Israelite way. And then he gives them ways for their sin to be atoned for and forgiven, like through the blood of an animal. And we can't run wild with this metaphor, okay? If we do, we'll make it mean something it doesn't mean. The blood of an animal represents life. And that lifeblood symbolically covered sin and evil with life. That's how God forgives sin. He forgives sin through life. And so we can't make it mean something it doesn't. We often read this and we think, oh, blood. Oh, well, if there's blood, then something had to die. And if something died, then God clearly loves death. And if God clearly loves death, then that's clearly what appeases the wrath of God. And I would say, no, that's a very pagan way to think. That is not the way the Israelites think. And and we have to remember that not only is it not death that satisfies God, it, the, the, the Israelites did not sacrifice animals. They didn't kill them on the altar. That's what the pagans did. They killed them off the altar, and then they brought the life blood. And they put it on the, the horns of the altar. But essentially, they gave this, this life to recognize the death that their sin had caused. And God covers it and forgives it through life. All right? You still with me? You still with me? Okay. Now, we continue through the Old Testament a little bit, and we read moments like the prophets crying out on behalf of God. In Jeremiah, uh, he says, Israel, I am your father, and, and you're like my firstborn. Or we read in Hosea, where God says, I will make you my wife forever, showing you righteousness and justice, unfailing love and compassion. I am bound to you. I will not forget you. But also in Jeremiah, (laughs) we hear God's sorrow that like an unfaithful wife to her husband, Israel has been unfaithful to him. We have been unfaithful to him. We made a covenant together like man and, and woman on the altar. And you've broken that covenant. You've been unfaithful to me. And this broken covenant continues to lead us and them further away from God and into sin and into exile and into slavery and taking everybody with us. So does God have wrath on sin? Does God have wrath on sin? Yes, he absolutely does. Why? Because it continues to destroy the way, the means that God wants to bring heaven and earth to become one reality. It continues to destroy a right relationship with God where we live faithful to one another on earth as it is in heaven. And so according to the scriptures, as Paul says, sin needs to be forgiven. It needs to be redeemed. It needs to be defeated so that the world may know their God and live in right relationship with him. And in order for this to happen, this is where it gets good, (laughs) is that the king must be put on his throne where all the world comes under his rule and reign. Not the evil and oppressive reign of the world represented in Egypt or Babylon or Rome, like he's writing to, but his perfectly good and just reign, the kingdom of God, where mercy and faithfulness and love and grace and holiness are its foundations, where the poor and needy and the the ill are given a place of honor instead of shame. The king must be put on his throne. And that is exactly what happens in this moment in Mark 15. All right, you got five more minutes? You with me? 
I, like, I don't want this to be too heady, but I think this is good. I think in these next five minutes, the word of God is going to speak much louder than I ever could. That's my hope anyway. <laughs> so let's see what Mark has to say about the cross, all right? All right, as I mentioned earlier, Mark seems to be writing to a Roman audience. Uh, the kingdom of Rome, per se, is the pinnacle of power in the world. And the Caesar, this oppressive and evil ruler, is the pinnacle of a king in the world. He is referred to literally as Lord and God, as savior to the world. And in Rome, peace and justice were brought through violent military victory. That's how peace and, and, and justice was brought. But over and over again, Jesus insists that that is actually the antithesis of the kingdom of God. It is the opposite, if you will, of what it looks like for heaven and earth to reign as one. And so I would just hasten to add at this point, this is a moment of reflection for all of us. Why don't we just look at the world around us? If Jesus points to something like the kingdom of Rome and says, that is the antithesis of what I imagine. When we look at our country or we look at ourselves or our world, how do we treat the poor? Do we avoid justice to the oppressed? Are we pledging allegiance to a political figure before Jesus? Are we becoming powerful through military, through military victory over the others? Are we placing our own needs on the throne before anybody others? Guys, I'm actually freezing. I'm stuttering over my own words. <laughs> I get cold easy. I don't know why. <laughs> but I'm inviting you to take an honest look at our world right now and say, does it look like the kingdom of God? And so as Mark takes his pen and he begins to tell the story of Jesus becoming our very substitute on the cross, he's suffering the fate of our sin, the, the consequence and the punishment that we had incurred on ourselves. You know what's amazing is that Mark doesn't write a tragic defeat or lost hope as we might expect, but he actually narrates a great victory and he narrates it like a king being inaugurated to his throne. Now, this is where I would point you to people like Thomas Schmidt, like Marty Solomon, like Ray Vanderlaan to tell you this, touch, this story much, much better than I will. But Mark actually tells the story of the crucifixion of Jesus as if it were the coronation of Caesar, the king, the emperor. So stick with me. You literally can't make this stuff up. It's so freaking good. <laughs> Mark parallels the coronation of Jesus to the crucifixion of Jesus. So here's what I want to do. I've got some slides for you. I know it's a little hard to see right now, but I will read them if you want to follow along with me. These are the parallels of a Caesar being coronated and Jesus being crucified. Step one, the Praetorian guard took the soon to, uh, would take the soon-to-be king, the Caesar, and gathered in the praetorium. Mark 15, verse 16. The soldiers led Jesus away into that same place, the praetorium, and called together the whole company of soldiers. Second step. Here we go. The guards would place a purple robe and crown the soon-to-be Caesar with a gold olive leaves, um, a crown of gold olive leaves. Mark 15, verse 17. I'm just going in order right here. They put a purple robe on him, then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him. Verse 3, the very next verses. Caesar was loudly acclaimed and praised as triumphant by the Praetorian guard. Verse 18, or verse 18 and 19, they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews. Again and again, they struck him on the head with a staff and spit on him. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him. Are you catching what's going on here? This is amazing, huh? This is no accident. All right, I'm going to skip a few just for the sake of time. Let's go to five. They would escort the king to Capitoline Hill. It was actually known as Head Hill, where he would be offered wine mixed with myrrh. And this was an incredibly royal drink, a very expensive drink. But he would refuse it and then pour it out onto the altar. Verse, fifth, or verse 22 and 23. They brought Jesus to the place called Calgatha, the place of the skull. But actually in Aramaic, it is Head Hill. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. I just make a note here. This is not a drink for criminals. This is a royal drink. Now I'm going to go ahead and finish it out here, all right? Uh, here we go. When the king to be arrived at his throne, they placed his second and third in command on his right. 
Then the gods, I should have lowercase that, gods, <laughs> would send some sort of divine sign, like an eclipse, a solar eclipse, or a flock of doves. Here we go, Mark, 15, or Mark 20, 15, 25, and beyond. It was nine in the morning when they crucified him. They crucified two rebels with him, one on his right and one on his left. And a darkness covered the land like a solar eclipse. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. And then the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. These are both heavenly signs from God uh, uh, putting his seal on this coronation of the king. So do you see what's happening here? This is good news. It's no wonder that the Roman soldier sits there and (laughs) claims that surely this is the son of God. He knows that he just saw a king coronated right in front of his eyes. He just watched the king take his throne. And what Mark is telling us right here, and I'm sorry, I've gone a little bit over time. What Mark is telling us right here is that Jesus takes his throne as king, not by violence or oppression or evil, but living a life of peace and justice and compassion. Friends, this is not a story of divine child abuse. This is the story of a King Jesus taking his rightful throne, forgiving the sins of the world by taking its punishment on himself. That same sin that it's made its home right here in you and me. I mean, if there is a Valentine's Day message, this is divine love. You know what I'm saying? He launches a peaceful revolution that will defeat evil and depression and sin for good. But the question is, Genesis, which king will you bow down to? Will you bow to the world or to the king of the world? Or in Mark, Caesar or Jesus? Because this is the new exodus. Out of slavery out of sin and evil and into the kingdom of God, not just some distant reality, but heaven and earth becoming one reality. And this is just where I want to take a moment as we wrap up to really find ourselves wrapped up in this story. God, where would we be without you? Where would we be without you? I I can tell you for sure, left to myself, I would definitely destroy myself. I remember my B.C. Tyler days good and well. You know what I'm saying? Those before Christ days. Uh, I can confidently say Jesus saved me. I was destructive and hurting myself and other people in my path. But what about you? Where would you be without God? Like the Israelites, uh, they marked themselves uh, with the blood of the innocent lamb to mark their freedom. And, And very similarly today, you and I are offered the opportunity to mark ourselves with the blood of Jesus that was shed on the cross, that has brought your forgiveness and saved you from the powers of sin. Why? To, re- to, to restore you back to your original vocation, to worship God, to live in right relationship with him, to reflect his image back into the world day by day by day. And this is why we live holy lives. You know what I'm saying? set apart from sin, set apart from evil. Not simply this moralistic thing of do's and don'ts and right and wrongs, but holy. Set apart as an offering that we do our very best to reflect God into this world. And when we mess up, he is faithful to cover us. He is faithful to forgive us. Not enabling us to live in our sin. That's not the message of grace, but empowering us to get up and move past it. That is the good news. And that is the message of grace. All right? So we're going to worship now. We're going to worship together. And I usually like, thank you guys. I usually like to kind of wrap up the, some messages with some, some ways to practice the way of Jesus in this world, okay? But tonight I took a bit of a different approach. I just want to ask you three questions. If you, got a, if you got a pen and paper or something, you can write these questions down and just reflect on them during worship, during this week. Chris, are you going to want to come up here at all? Okay, cool. So question number one, how does the cross help you understand sin, but live in grace? How does the cross help you understand sin, but live in grace? Are you heading 90 miles per hour down a back road? Are you out of control? God is faithful to forgive in his mercy and in his love. He is faithful to save you. 
Or has sin simply become some moral checklist of rights and wrong, do's and don'ts, where we actually don't really need God because we can just save ourselves by doing enough right things? And how does this enable you to live in grace, that he's not some moralistic deity waiting to crush you, but he is actually a good God inviting you into his mission to save the world where his kingdom will come and will be done through you as it is in heaven. Question number two, how does the cross help you live the vocation God has called you to? You can continue to reflect on this during worship. Maybe tonight, actually during worship, we need to take a very honest look at ourselves, myself included. Do our lives reflect that mission we've been called to? And honestly, what areas of our life don't? Can we actually tonight give them to God as a pleasing aroma, as a special gift to him? And I would just encourage you also, like don't be afraid to confess your sins tonight. You can go to somebody. It's not an act of shame. It is one of the greatest gifts. If I cannot save myself, then I cannot do it alone. I need people with me to walk the journey of salvation together. And then my final question for you, have you accepted Jesus as your Savior and King? For some of you tonight, this is the first time you've heard the good news of Jesus, and you're like, yes, I want to be a part of that. I want to receive that sacrifice, that blood that Jesus covered my sins with, and and then I want to give my life back to him as a sacrifice. I want it to be a pleasing aroma and special gift to him, out of the slavery of sin and evil and into the kingdom of God. But maybe there's some of us here tonight who are like, yeah, I've believed in God for a really long time, but I've never let Jesus be the king of my life. I've always been the one in control. Actually, tonight, you also are invited to receive the salvation of God, to be put on mission in this world, to become a part of his kingdom come and his will be done on earth. So that's your invitation. Which king, Genesis, will we bow to? The earth and the kingdoms of the earth or the king of the earth, Jesus? Perfect timing. Wow. (laughs) Man, I was spreading that all week. Let me pray for us, guys. We're going to worship. Gosh, Jesus, we love you so much. And first and foremost, we just want to say thank you. The cross is not just some distant idea. It's not just some elusive metaphor. It is King Jesus taking his throne, defeating the powers of evil and darkness, both in the world and in us. Jesus, you are our savior. You are the savior of our lives and you are savior of the world. And so tonight we just actually sing it out. We sing out that we are your offering. We want to be a sacrifice back to you, Jesus, of thanksgiving, of gratitude. Let us be a part of your kingdom come and your will be done where heaven and earth will reign as one. We have that great hope in you, Jesus, and we thank you for this new exodus that you've invited us out of the slavery of sin and evil and into the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. We love you so much, Jesus. Amen. Why don't you guys stand while we worship?